this class, just in a different context from a kind of institutional perspective. And it's called Unpacking the President's Knapsack. And there would have been an apostrophe here. I don't know what happened. You may not notice that. So you may know who this is. This is President Obama. Um, one of his. That was when he was smiling. Yeah. <laughs> it's coming back. It is. Uh, I've, I've been very impressed with the President, but that's, that's another topic. So, one of his goals was to make some changes to No Child Left Behind and the educational initiatives of his predecessor. And part of that initiative is the American Graduation Initiative. Uh, President Obama has earmarked $50 million towards the creation of OER. These materials are targeted at the general education and community college level. Um, the reason that the target is here is that there's this desire to radically increase the amount of people who have access to an associate's degree, while at the same time making a deficit negative, um, because you know, we're spending a lot of money that we don't necessarily have. And the President's task force in this identified open educational resources as an area where money could be spent that would ultimately produce net savings over the long run. Um, central to this effort is open access to these materials. And that means that the materials will be produced in a way where there's the copyright in them is not restrictive. They'll be released under a Creative Commons license and allowed to be shared, although not necessarily remixed under a derivatives license, but made available to people so colleges, universities, and high schools can use them essentially for free, just paying the kind of transaction costs. But before we get too into this, I want to say what is Creative Commons and what is a Creative Commons license? I'm sure that a lot of you know this already, but just in order to be thorough, I want to kind of quickly run through it. Um, most basically, Creative Commons is a nonprofit corporation designed, dedicated to making it easier for people to share and build upon the work of others consistent with the rules of copyright. This is from their website. There are, some people have issues with Creative Commons, some people really like Creative Commons, but this is just kind of what they say. Fundamentally, what they're trying to do is create another regime outside of and around copyright that allows for uses that were simply done unofficially under copyright law. So whereas I could say to everyone who is going to be looking at this lecture, I just won't sue you. Um, Creative Commons is a mechanism by stating that officially I won't sue you if you do something with my lecture. And so as I was saying, the Creative Commons licenses mark creative work um, with a freedom the creator wants to carry. So you can have some kind of mixture of sharing, remixing, commercial uses, attribute attributed uses, derivative works, something thereof. And let me also, before I get too far into this, I want to say what are OER? And I just every time I say that, I just there's a pirate joke in there somewhere. <laughs> like what are, are I don't know, I, I can never make it work. Um, <laughs> OER are <laughs> Kind of the brainchild of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation in, in coordination with um, certain elements of the UN. And what William and Flora Hewlett have been, have been very, very active in doing is promoting ways, promoting people to create open educational resources, primarily with an international bent. Their idea was that you know the world could be helped by the access to high quality educational materials being made available in places where they wouldn't otherwise have been made available. We have a strong OER office in the University of Michigan, Open Dot Michigan. It's not the largest OER, but by any standards, but it's one of the kind of most forward things. So we're lucky to have this resource at this university. And some of you may be aware of the Describe project, where a lot of people in the School of Information are involved in taking materials produced by professors and converting them to OER. And this distinction is actually fairly important. I'm not just putting this for solely for background, because what we're looking at here is people creating materials from the outset to become open educational resources, as opposed to taking materials that were created for you know, this class and then trying to open them to a certain degree. Um, OER have gained a lot of attention among certain scholarly, progressive scholarly networks and commentators. Um, this guy right here, who you may know as Johan Menkler, wrote a book called The Wealth of Networks, which is kind of the precursor to the environment in which OER can be created. And his statement there is basically talks about how you can create digital learning objects by having an environment where there's a lot of freely available objects which are chunky and can be like combined together in terms in, in order to create materials that can be then used for education. Um, Benkler talks 
about the kind of frictionless marketplace that the internet provides for creating these materials and talk about how many hours of creativity can be freed up. A really good example is if you have a class with 100 students and each one of them spends 10 hours working on a project that will ultimately be made open. Well, you've just given you know, 1,000 hours of work. That's you working 20 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, towards creating um, an open educational resource. And with the frictionless network provided by the internet, there is a lot of ability to free up this creativity, to free up this work, and to make real resources. I deal with that, Claire. Uh, he's awesome because he's an unreconstructed Marxist, which is very rare in this day and age. Um, <laughs> totally clear, and he has the beard to show it. Some of the things that are that have come out of this are the Open Textbook Initiative. Um, California gave money, and they produced 19 open textbooks, I think 16 of which passed 90% of their certification, so I'm not really sure what that number actually is, 90% of 16 of this is the math person. That can do it. But you know, a non-trivial amount of textbooks that are now freely available that meet educational requirements in California schools. Not everybody thinks that OER are totally amazing. Um, so two, you know, I dare say, pretty qualified commentators presented a paper at TPRC stating that there's a big gap between OER as a production being stage one, let's produce OER, stage three being a kind of global educational commons. Stage two is a little bit murky. Um, this paper was presented by Bobby Blushko and the Listen Sense Bobby, so I'm sorry, I can't help myself, that was totally shameless. Um, I, am, I recognize that name. I'm somewhat dubious, I guess, of the value of OER. It's ironic, I know. But there tend to be disconnects between the way that they're produced and the way that they're actually used. But all I'm really trying to say is that there isn't a really clear consensus on the efficacy of OER as it is currently understood, at least if we measure efficacy by creating materials that lead to positive educational outcomes. Back to this guy, though. So what it really is he doing? Um, Obama actually announced this at Michigan, and he talked about how he was going to create these materials to re-empower the American worker, to create jobs, and to provide the ability to get, for pretty much any American who wants to get an associate, associate's degree to get one easily and cheaply. And these goals really seem great. He wants to increase graduation rates dramatically. He wants to lower costs and take stress off the Pell Grant system and off the budget as well. And he's going to do this by reducing waste, which is what they always say whenever they're going to find all, this, all these inefficiencies that no one else has been able to find in the system. And they're going to produce open educational resources. So, I mean, how could there be any possible problems with a, you know, a proposal that just seems this good in this room? Well, as I've always, as I've begun to learn here, you must, oh, 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 oh. well, you must be aware of the unintended consequences. <laughs> this is actually really bad. Using? I'm using Prezi, and I'm not super skilled with it yet, as you can tell. <coughs> See, that kills my reveal. Is this a Mac only program? No, 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 no it's online. It's free. Yeah. Yeah. Prezi.com. Oh, wow. Pure easy, wow. easy app. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. So, <laughs> you, know, you have to be aware of the unintended consequences. Um, a government initiative on this scale is not going to be without another set of side effects. And some of them that the research is beginning to show is that they're maybe economic problems with having a large top-down inf influx of cash into the production of something like open educational resources. Um, a lot of faculty members wait until later in their career. They produce textbooks. They make a lot of money. Uh, there's a real incentive towards having expert-level faculty produce books that have kind of come out of a lifetime of research. You know, if you're a junior faculty member, no one tells you to write a textbook. They think you're crazy to write a textbook your first four or five, six years until you have tenure, until you've established yourself. So there's kind of a presumption of expertise in established, published, peer-reviewed materials. And it's, you know, it's uncertain whether removing all of the economic incentives from that would get the same class and quality of people to produce the materials. There are also social problems with the production of OER students tend not to be as comfortable with materials they consider to be open. I have research out of Michigan that states that um, a significant number of students in the class, in the chemical engineering control theory class, it was, you know, 100 students over several years were surveyed, 
and they tended to be uncomfortable and uncomfortable with using an open educational textbook and wanted to go back to a more traditional text, even with the knowledge that the text was 40 years out of date and used math that is no longer really possible. That people don't, it's not possible to do that math anymore because it's pencil and paper math designed for you know controlling a brewery, whereas now control theory is you know complex computer math designed for controlling an autopilot. But they still were so uncomfortable with the idea of having a textbook that didn't come out of a big publisher and form money that they didn't want to use it. And the third thing is educational. Um, there's not any really clear data on the educational value of <coughs> educational resources yet. Now, it's, there's also not very much, the, the data on non-open resources is also somewhat up in the air. I mean, different types of educators using different types of material will produce different types of outcome depending on the way that they're, they, they're teaching it. But one of the, the issues with the educational, um, one of the issues with education of open educational resources is that there isn't a very good uh, evaluation system for how these materials are produced, the quality of them, and how they connect learners to outcomes. There are organizations like Merlot, which try to sift through materials and kind of promote them. There was the effort in California, which did result in textbooks that, that did come up, but there's still a lot of uncertainty over how these things, over how these things are actually going to work. So when you see this, I have to come to this kitty, and I'm like, I give up. It's not really worth it. <laughs> <laughs> we probably shouldn't do this, but actually that's not really true. I don't really think that's the case at all. I do think that the President's Initiative has the potential to save a ton of money to involve people in education and to kind of recreate the way that we see education as a society. Um, a lot of educational theory is coming to, a lot of educational theory has come to, come to the conclusion that it no longer makes sense to have actually, you know, the kind of classroom layout where a professor writes from their notes from 30 years ago and kind of lays it out to the students. And a lot of progressive education is moving away from that. For example, MIT, who is a pioneer in open education, has begun to re even physically redesign their classrooms as a result of experiential open learning where students are helping produce curricula. And it is resulting in wildly increased educational outcomes when it's taken from the very beginning of the project all the way to the end, taking user input in the design of the process. So it can be done extremely well. Whether it will be done well in this government initiative, I'm not certain. But I do believe that there's a lot of potential, and frankly, something needs to change, so I'm glad that someone's actually really trying to address the problem. As I said, there's a lot to be gained here. $50 million really isn't that much money <coughs> in the way the government, so if my policy paper is going to be taking a position that this is a very good idea, I support the president in this initiative, and I, you know, insofar as I can, hope to be involved in seeing it successful. Was that, too, was that too short? Quick, I was surprised. I always feel people, I don't want to talk too long. Yeah, okay. so. Yes? I have a question about the research study with the chemistry students. Yes. Did they give reasons why they felt that the traditional textbook was more, yeah. was so more reliable or trustworthy? It's really funny. So the first year, students really didn't like it because they had produced it themselves. And they were like, I just, I don't trust myself and my fellow classmates and sister classmates to have produced something of the highest quality. They also that year gave the reason that they just simply liked a book, right? Um, as time went on and they had been editing students' work and refining the textbook until the third year where it was actually, you know, by, any, by any read, a very high quality book, they didn't like the fact that it kind of called into question their understanding of science. So they liked the idea that science was this thing that they could learn from another source objective truth, immutable fact, and the fact that they had produced it just really shocked their worldview. So there was a lot of uncertainty about, I want to know that an expert has told me something, and that thing has not changed. And it's funny because even knowing that the textbook was out of date, they still preferred it, right? It's, it is kind of odd, but the, you know, the, the numbers were really there. They really did prefer it. So I think it's maybe it's a bias towards, it's, it's a, a bias towards expertise. Uh, lack of confidence, and also to some degree, an educational system that hasn't been producing thinkers who are comfortable in that kind of environment. And that's something that this project might, you know, help address. Do you think maybe part of it was I get to pay for the book, so therefore it's better? You know, it was actually, that was one of their reasons the professor chose to do the project was students were complaining about how much the book cost. So the book cost $110. And producing it on espresso cost 10, but the students didn't like to pay for the book, and they also didn't like that they didn't have to pay for the book. 
I'm just curious, how, with rolling out this plan, I mean, how long is it um, expected to take and how wide is it expected to go? So it's the National Education Technology Plan, which is a four-year plan. Um, it's there, it's work, being worked on directly with Carnegie Mellon University and a series of community colleges surrounding them. Um, it, so it's expected to go for the next four years until the next major technology overall. And it's supposed to be distributed to every community college in the country that wants to take part of it. Because, you know, it's a, the marginal cost of producing another OER module is zero. So once you've put the fixed cost in, you know, you, you should sell it yourself for the marginal cost. And so you give it to as many people as you possibly can. Going off that earlier thing you know, with the textbooks, I guess I would argue that that is one of the outcomes that we're looking for educationally wise is teaching our students that science is not necessarily a hard, fast rule kind of thing. And to me, that is one of the outcomes of OER, something that we should be pushing. Yeah, it's, it's challenging. I mean, you want to help encourage people to come to that realization, but at the same time, that there, there are a lot of biases that are, are working against you. And some of them right. are the people's internal biases, but then there is a kind of external bias that, you know, it's pervasive, that belief in society that you have to kind of consult with someone else until you have become an expert. And it's kind of like, you know, being a hell of angel. You only become an expert once you know you're one. I guess it, there's no real, like, validation system in terms of becoming an expert. So it is very challenging. I mean, it's really hard to see how you go about doing that. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, well, kind of a comment. So yesterday I was at this conference called Connections, for the Connections software, which is an open textbook platform. Um, and there are a lot of people there that were doing research in the production and, and recreation and, and use of connections-based open textbooks. And there were some people from ISKME, I-S-K-M-E, um, Institute for Study of Knowledge Management and Education. Um, I'll send you links, don't worry. Excellent, um, thank you. That did research in the production of the California free textbook. So, and they found that some of the main, like they were focusing on the production of, so they're looking at authors, um, faculty, not necessarily students. Um, and they found that the benefits, there were many more benefits than, than drawbacks for the faculty as, as what they saw. Um, and most of them revolved around collaboration with other professors and experts in their fields to kind of break down these silos of knowledge and, and make more efficient textbooks, basically. Um, and then also a lot of our people were saying how, for faculty-wise, I want my textbook up here scrutinized by the world so that my textbook gets better, you know, kind of ideas. I mean, so, you know, there, there are two right. ideas embedded there. And I right. think that, on one hand, faculty do derive benefit from working with other faculty through collaboration. Um, on the other hand, faculty that in my survey work that I've done to yeah. lead up here, they don't tend to feel that they're getting a lot of value out of this in terms of their career progression or financially. So, you know, if you talk to a tenure committee, what is the value of an open educational textbook, it's like you probably should have spent that time writing three articles. Okay. So it's almost a negative thing to have done. Yeah, this is, that's yeah. what I'm hearing too. Yeah. Well, you're getting into a different area. I have some other questions, but this whole idea of incentives, I mean, this is, this, this is something that, uh, that that's almost a, you know, sort of an overlay on top of this, and that is that that's, that's quite the case. I mean, I keep having these arguments all the time with university officials about criteria for tenure, which I think, I mean, I, I think the university is almost like the Catholic Church. You don't go into the priesthood unless you believe in the in, in the theology. I mean, you don't you don't have rene you don't have too many renegade priests running around saying that the, that the incentives should be something entirely different. But we have the same thing in the university. In fact, you know, I could, I could specify exactly. You know, if anybody came to me and said, "Well, how do I get tenure at the University of Michigan?" I tell them exactly how to do it. The main way to do it is to find a couple of professors that have tenure and figure out what they did and do the same thing. I mean, it's certainly don't do anything new, don't do anything different, don't do anything interesting. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. that's a cynical yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, no. It's a conservative institution. I mean, like, right. I mean, but, change but is slow, and someone does have to okay. be first. I was on committees, you know, 10 years ago, I was on committees on educational technology when all the internet was coming in and all this technology, PowerPoint, and everything was coming into the classroom. And uh, we basically said, if you're an assistant professor, if you don't have tenure, forget it. Don't do anything that, that, you know, don't spend the time.
time to prepare the course and put them online or to prepare materials or, or textbooks or anything else because it's absolutely worthless and will kill your career. I, I mean, it's, it's that clear, you know, it's, in that sense. So the incentives for this are very different. But where I'm, where, uh, does anybody want to talk about that tomorrow? Because that's an issue. I guess one thing I would add is that there is an element of, of, of altruistic incentive that people can be sort of on. And that's kind of what Hewlett's main goal has been, is saying, you know, you're not, this may not assist you so much in the end year, this may not make you any money, but we're going to change the world with this. Yeah, it's been a very compelling argument. It's the day, it, I'm not sure how much it's true. It sounds really good. But you don't want to kill your career as a Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're and, anyway. Well, so has there been any studies that show that participating in this is a detriment, as opposed to, like, you need study. well, I mean, is, <laughs> so there are, are good um, examples of people that have. The University of California oh, yeah. just released a report, um, it's like 700 pages, and I haven't read <laughs> the entire thing, so about attitudes yeah, towards open educational resources, and there's certainly a lot of fear among younger faculty and skepticism among older faculty, right. and those two things together, I believe, or at least provide a kind of um, circumstantial case right. that it would hurt your career. And if nothing else, it's simply time that's not used to publish. Right. Because I mean, I'm just trying to think of people that I've worked with at School of Reclamation, you know, some professors I can name off, that they're going up for tenure. And they personally see it as a good thing for them. But their tenure committees might not, might, may or might not. Um, and I'm just curious. But this is the quiet. Well, this is if ever it was exactly. required, it right. is. And so, if you're going to if you're going to start this movement, this is a great place to start. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm really for open educational oh, resources. Yeah. I just want to be realistic about the challenges in implementing them, which is why I'm so bullish about a governmental initiative to do so, because I feel that that, that private initiatives are kind of encountering some difficulties. So, do you have? Well, I, I was just going to say. I mean, you know, we've had people here. <laughs> but, you know, the cream rises to the top. He's now an associate dean at the University of Washington. But still, uh, this is the kind of thing that I think is, is yeah. you know, so demonstrable that any kind of creative effort like this, you know, is a career killer for people who try to do something. Or well, you could land at Princeton. You know, I mean, you could get lucky and, like, go to a place that really values a certain set of behaviors, not necessarily publishing like research. Well, that, that's possible. Is Obama's initiative straight up just money broadly? Is it addressing any of this economic concerns that faculty are going to have? Or? So it, they're actually working with educational professors at professors of education and professors of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University. That's where a lot of this money is going. And they're developing like a cohesive set of materials that kind of provi uh, provide education very completely and thoroughly within kind of contained modules. So it's less of an issue because these people are working under a government grant. I mean, it may address the problem indirectly by providing legitimacy for this kind of behavior, but there's no like, you know, there's no governmental interaction with tenure committees, and so far as I'm aware. I mean, and this is also part of a larger governmental initiative to increase college graduation, like in making Pell Grants available. So it's, it's a big push, this is just one element of it. I just had a question in terms of this kind of speaks to maybe like Elliot Maxwell's speech earlier, but what is the um, the means, or if you want to explain more, the associate degree program and how they're getting certified with degree based? Well, the associate degree is like you know the two year degree that you get out of a out of a community college, and so the idea is to create a series of high quality educational materials that will be sufficiently robust and you know and provide a sufficient educational outcome that they will be something that will be accepted by. So there's a lot of work being done in this area, like David Wiley out of um, Utah State, but now Brigham Young, talked about how do you create materials that four-year colleges will then accept as valid. So that is part of the problem. But I think that's less of a problem when you have a team of people who are kind of like, tra who do their work in creating distance educational, open educational materials. Um, it's 
it's been a problem so far. Like, you know, you can't get a degree off of taking MIT coursework courses. But I think it, this will be less of a problem because, again, the government stamp will be on it. So it will have a kind of greater sense of legitimacy as part of the technology plan, the education plan. Isn't John C. Lee Brown awaiting certification for his little, or not John C. Lee Brown, sorry. Is it Yokai Banker that start, is starting the one in Utah? David Wiley. David Wiley. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's, but, he's awaiting yeah. certification, but David I don't know. He's going to be waiting a while, I think. But widely published that, he's yeah. widely stated that all open educational resource will be dead by 2012. So he's like, all university OER initiatives will be, will be dead by 2012, unless they are being funded through distance education. Right. And it yeah. just so happens that he works for distance education. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if he, he uh, his grad student just released a, yeah. uh, just published his thesis that basically talked about how to monetize distance education. <laughs> and frankly, you know, if you're David Wiley, you might be a, been doing your grad student a huge favor by like, raising this problem and then like knowing <laughs> that he's writing this thesis <laughs> the entire time. It's pretty cool. Any further questions? Isn't that, yeah. kind, of, isn't that kind of counterproductive, though? I mean, the whole idea of making open educational resources is to make them available to people. And so monetizing yeah. it kind of seems... So I'm going to get What's into this, into the paper. I'm going to try to develop this thought a little bit as I write. Um, and I'm glad that you actually picked that conference up because it's good. Uh, you can do these things in hybrid systems. So you can have a open component while at the same time having a co or pay component that involves maybe more interaction with the faculty member, um, different kinds of evaluation materials, kind of providing an add-on service that you would kind of link to from your open material. So like, do you like this open French course? Wouldn't you like it better if you could connect to this open French course by paying $50 a month? So Other open educational resource singles yeah, are available exactly. in your area, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's only a matter of time. At Brigham Young, we were getting 5% conversion on their materials, which in terms of internet sales is like astronomical, right. how much they're yeah, and, and the follow-up to that is you don't get certification for taking any OER class. You get certification by taking class and paying for it. Right. Um, so it would be more like a paid evaluation system then at that point. So you can you can look at the materials all you want, but you only get the certification if you pay, to take, pay to take the exam. And then if you fail the exam, you pay to take it again. To go back well, a little bit, there, there is an <laughs> OER, like you know, the what are OER issue. Some people tend to be very, fairly purist about I mean, I, I know the difference. Do you want to explain what's different about what Carnegie Mellon's doing uh, as opposed to, say, like, what MIT has done? Or well, Open Michigan. Okay. Or, yeah, or Open Michigan. Yeah, Sorry. MIT and cool. Michigan, what they've done is they've taken professors' courses and they've published them online for free with, a, with some sort of license on them, be it, you know, a remix license or a distributed license. What Carnegie Mellon has done is they've created courses from the ground up for open education. Um, you know, they, they hire actors, they write their own dialogue, they write their own questions. Um, they're, what they do is a lot more expensive than what the cost of MIT doing it or us doing it. But it's a, just a, it's a totally different approach. There's and Obama, President Obama is going with that approach in terms of this initiative. There's a, uh, a large portion of the courseware, too, is interactive, isn't it? Like, yeah, I mean, almost, almost, like, almost like game-oriented sort of interactive. It's like Flash. They have a special Flash dev kit. So, are you, so you're going to be focusing on, on that aspect of it then? I'm Mainly? focusing on the governmental initiative. So that initial so part since of the that's focused was, on Carnegie yeah, Mellon. was just some background that, that the existence of other OER, and I may get into a kind of, should we have do more funding from kind of ground up OER? Um, that's something that I may explore, but I, I, I'm kind of inclined to focus on the actual effects of what's going on there, because there's good data coming out there, and I want to get into some quant stuff. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah.
that suggests that, you know, I talked about this in the very first class, uh, something that, that troubles me about uh, education in general, in that it, it, it suggests that the model is, uh, you know, I'm going to provide education to you, capital E, and I know more than you do. You know, I'm Dr. Science. I have a master's degree in science, and you don't. So therefore, I'm going to lay it on, and I'm going to provide the resources to, to teach you organic chemistry, French, whatever is the, the subject matter. And I'm, I'm coming to, to realize, and maybe this is just because it's late in my career, that that model is, is a very limited one. And that, that the model, I was having this dialogue with one of my colleagues here at the school, and I was saying that, you know, your job is not to teach. Your job is to give students the confidence and the intellectual curiosity to learn. And that's a very different thing. But those skills, it seems to me, will stay with you a lot longer than learning about particular policies, particular uh, structures, or whatever you know, whatever it is, you know, programming languages, that whatever it is that you're learning at any given time. And that that getting that ability, and especially now that the research tools are becoming more effective, more efficient, more that what you want to do is get to get people that, that intellectual curiosity to learn and, and to put that together. And what I'm finding is that there are a whole series of subjects you know, that this is subject specific. And yes, if you're trying to teach high school seniors French, this model might work and you can put together, but the, it's getting to the point where if you wanted to learn French, there are probably uh, a dozen to a hundred ways, uh, resources that you could get, both paying for and not paying for, and, uh, to learn the, the subject matter. But when you're talking about something that's a little more ambiguous, like when, when I teach uh, about entrepreneurship, I always joke, and it's, but it's only half a joke, that if I really knew how to teach the stuff, I'd have an infomercial on late night TV and make a fortune. <laughs> I'd be selling it like the Ronco or you know, start a company and always be successful. Or it'd be like a, you know, a method for counting cards at Las Vegas or something. I mean, it, you know, th there would be a method that I could, could, that would be worth money. But the problem is that these things are all situational. And the learning, uh, the, the, the learning that I think is most effective is also situational. That is to say, you know, once you leave the the ivory tower here and go out into whatever job you choose, your effectiveness is going to be determined by your intellectual curiosity and your ability to learn about the material you need to learn for that particular situation. And as the world changes in that direction, it seems to me it obviates this whole idea of, of trying to create educational resources. Uh, now, it may you know, so I'm wondering about that, whether, whether the assumption here is that the reason our student, you know, our kids aren't learning is because the materials are defective? I think the assumption is that there are people who want to be, I mean, the reason behind this idea is that there are people who want to be educated who are unable to do so because they can't afford it and they don't have access. So, you know, there's only so much money available for Pell Grants for student loans. Um, I think one of the ideas behind this is that by creating high quality materials that are available, are available at no cost, the government's going to be stretching that, that money a lot further than they would if they were giving it out for students to buy textbooks and things like that. Uh, your point, your greater point though, I think is far more significant because it kind of calls into question the way our educational system is run. Right. I think that's to some degree out of the scope of the analysis I want to undertake. But I do think that there's a, a real issue there, which is how do you teach people to become creative, investigative, self-directed learners? Um, and I'm not, I'm not really sure. I mean, some, in some ways, you don't really need to be. Like, I, I, I would argue that you could take a textbook written in 1860 in differential calculus and probably teach someone differential calculus today. And there would be very little difference between those two things. I think other kinds of classes
classes, there is a huge significance in that you can't synthesize that outside of the experience and the relationships in the individual professor. But you know, there are a lot of people out there who need to learn differential calculus, and they want to be able to do it cheaply with good access and in a massive scale. And there is a value to that. No, I think there is, but I, I think I think the assumption is, you know, for only what that does, what that says to me is this is valuable for a particular kind of education. And not necessarily all education. Well, and that's the problem, that's one of the problems with our education system is that we produce some of the greatest thinkers in the world, but we also produce a lot of people who are only educated different degree. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that, right? But we do produce some of the most brilliant thinkers in the world, but then we allow people just kind of turn them through the system and give them very a Very diplomatic. Yeah. That was very, very PC yeah, Very diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> Consider career in the State Department. Thank you. <laughs> so then we set them out, you know. Because Victor's point, I think, is very interesting from at least my vantage, um, is that there are two key variables in play here with this initiative. Right? One is to uh, use uh, supposedly new and better educational dissemination methods, meaning distance education, along with improved content. And the question becomes one if the ultimate goal isn't just the sheer number of people completing those associate's degrees, but some measure of, the, uh, of both the effectiveness and the efficiency of that knowledge transfer. You know, how do you separate those two? You know variables because there's, there's some really intervention. You know effect. That's a really good point, and some that's something I, I do want to address. Yeah, that, that, because yeah. the government doing it, you're going to really want to. They're going to need to produce some numbers, right? They're going to say we did this, and then we had a 200 percent increase in this region, and then we all these more people. And look how much we succeeded. But ultimately, your question it's a very deeper point, which is what is how do we measure success besides just really stamping out right? You know, and and, and you know what does the uh, um, you know, document that supports this initiative say in terms of the expected outcomes. You that's know, what, that's what are the specific good. objectives, and then what are the outcomes, well, and then the objectives are just to increase graduation, to increase, like we're not, and there are some hard and fast issues there. Like we're, we aren't creating enough line engineers. We are not creating enough, like you know, programmers. We're just not. We don't. We don't simply make enough of them to right. meet the needs that we have. So. Right. It may solve a problem in the sense of, but yeah, there is a, another problem as well yeah. embedded in that problem. Yeah. So it's not only the goals and the outcomes, but what are the assessment criteria going to be? Right. And, yeah. and uh, are they validated as well? But that's at the same at the same time. That's at the heart of the criticism, like the no child left behind policy. Right. Right. We have a relative who's a principal in an inner city school, and you know, he's, he's saying all we're doing is teaching to the test. Yeah. And that this is not uh, this is not achieving any real educational objective. Said, I think the key thing that you said was we're, we're trying to do this to increase graduation rates. Well, you can do that in other ways too. You could, yeah, you, you, you could do that in other ways. I mean, yeah. this ideally has the idea of, of yeah. producing good grad, but you could just like lower standards, right? That is another way that you could increase yeah. graduation right. rates. So I want to take a little bit of issue with that part of the discussion um, because I don't think that's what the goal is. I think the goal is secondarily to increase education levels, mm -hmm. primarily to decrease the cost of producing new educational resources. So I'm a professor, I need to, I'm an adjunct professor at a community college. Usually you find out you're teaching one of these courses two weeks before you're gonna teach it. Like you're thrown, it's a stone in your lap. And I, I heard a lot of stories from people at the Connections Conference yesterday that's like, I get thrown a, a class sometimes the day before that I know it's gonna happen. Um, I need some way to make this course good and easy for me to do it in a day. Um, and a lot of the times that means that I need to find resources that I can use and make my own, make them localized in, in many different ways of defining the word localized, not only translated to other different languages, which you can't do with those resources, it's a copyright infringement, but localized for the specific educational needs of your students or your goals for that class, no, that's which you can't do point. with there is a network effect to producing so, these materials. Like right. once you have a significant mass of them, it becomes easier to make more. So, and then that, right. that, that, that's a very good point. So is the objective of this to undermine the economic structure that supports the sale of textbooks? Uh, who, who's the uh, owner? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> it may be an unintended consequence, right? I'm actually right? asking for you. My opinion, yes. Uh, Paul Carant's opinion, yes. Jack Bernard's opinion, he's a lawyer. He's not that. <laughs> that's I mean, awesome. There's a... There's a... That's un, that could very well be an unintended consequence. I mean, like, if high-quality materials are available for free, then there's not going to be much of a market for high-quality materials at cost. It's a lot of money. But there's a market for added benefit. There's a market for added value. Like, you were talking about courses that are free online, but come and pay for close, you know, work with a professor that will answer your questions by email or you can call them or whatever. There, there's benefit. still a market for added benefits. And we are expanding this concept a bit beyond where right. I think we necessarily <laughs> go, just because it's not the government's role to protect a business model, but it's also something that's worth thinking about when you initiate a policy decision, whether it will annihilate a business model. So, so this, yeah, this sounds like it, the policy is to annihilate the business model. Well, the policy probably may have the unintended consequences. I'm not sure whether it's a direct. Just like the internet annihilated the CD business model. Yeah. It's not the music business model. It's the CD business model. Or, you know, the buggy whips really stopped right, selling exactly. as well in that, 1915, that 1916. I mean, the, the music <laughs> industry is still going on. But, the CD but at the same time, it's still worth thinking about that these things might happen. Right. Um, yeah. Because you do something. Right. Um, so we talk a lot about, like, unintended consequences and stuff. What about unintended benefits? So this is like a national, you know, this is like a national, like, just a federal sort of, you know, motive here, right? We want to pay Carnegie Mellon to create a set of, well, and others, but mainly Carnegie Mellon, to create a set of instructional materials that are designed with the purpose of being utilized online um, by a large group of people for free. Um, so what happens if, you know, what happens with, like, brain drain countries, um, like Ghana or, um, you know, like the Lesotho or something like that. Yeah, or, you know, or, or Lesotho, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously Ghana is like a huge deal here because we have so, so many grad students specifically with an SI that are working with Ghana, but, um, and, for, and from Ghana too, actually. Um, but, I mean, there's obviously the unintended benefit of assisting those countries, and that's almost gray area too because there's a lot of criticism of bringing other countries, that further developing other countries hurting countries that are already developed and the Actually, worldwide Ghana economy is, is funny because Ghana has leapfrogged us in terms of producing these materials because Ghana never had the infrastructure to do e-learning and to acquire textbooks on a kind of uh, Ghanaian universities don't, didn't have the resources to acquire them in the way that we did so they've actually gone directly to we are and they're, they've skipped an entire like 30 years of, of uh, kind of like Edu education. Of the business model of yeah. education so now they're producing these materials in house um, with tenure recognition for producing them as well at like some universities. So that's actually kind of a funny example that you picked on it because Ghana has kind of one up this in terms of this. Um, I know my talk was a little bit short. I, 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 well, I can keep question, answering questions. The question period is quite so, long, so yeah. it's fine. <laughs> yeah. uh, it turns out I was just, I, I was just a little bit shocked that I was just 20 speaking minutes really fast. We ended. So, <laughs> sorry, I can't. So I don't know if very close way. Anyway, I, I wanted to get to something else, though. Uh, last night, there was a program on called Digital Nation on uh, PBS. Anybody see it? OK. Uh, I'd actually like, just as an aside, to assign that. It's on PBS.org. You can watch, watch it on there. Uh, I, what happened with that, th this is one of these things that um, I watched because I was interested in it, but 